the councils are doing on what the councils are doing about climate change. And let's start with a moment of quiet reflection, bringing our minds together for this task. Kia hiwa ra e ngā teina o te taiao, a ranginui rawa papa tua nuku. Tia kina te whare nui a tānei, ki te kore au, ka kore he whare ora. Yeah. Can, can, the, can the person with the, the baby please put your speaker on mute? Thank you. Tia kina te wai a tangaroa, ki te kore kwe, ka kore he wai ora. Tia kina te hau a tāwhiri mātea, ki te kore ia, ka kore he wai ora. Tia kina. Tia kina, tihe Māori ora. So take care of the house of Tane, the forest. If I don't do it, we won't have a healthy forest. Take care of the water of Tangaroa. If you don't do it, we won't have healthy water. Take care of the atmosphere of Tafiri Matea. If he doesn't do it, we won't have a healthy atmosphere. I'm Joanna Santa Barbara, co-chair of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum. And this is one of the events of Climate Action Week in Nelson Tasman. The purpose of this event is twofold. Firstly, both councils have been working on aspects of climate change for some years, and we want to know about and give them credit for what they've done and what they're planning to do. Climate change as part of human ecological overshoot threatens the integrity of the web of life that supports us. It needs all of us working together to bring the human endeavor back into balance with nature. And the second purpose is the citizen side of this dialogue. Councils need and want to know and hear from us what needs to be done and how fast. So tonight we'll begin with a round of questions to the councils about what they're doing. And then we'll turn to you, the participants, for your questions and comments. We have 90 minutes, which I think will go fast. So I'll ask both panel and participants to keep your questions and comments succinct. And how to ask your questions, we want this to be as direct as possible. So if you, if you uh, use your mouse to scroll um, the lower bar, you'll find um, a, an icon for, that says reactions. And if you click that icon, you'll see a, a little, it says raise hand. There it is. Um, so when you want to ask a question, click raise hand. And then when your question's been answered, lower that it says lower hand so let me now with pleasure introduce our panel of very distinguished people starting with mayor tim king who is mayor of tasman district tim is into his eighth term as an elected member of tasman district council he was deputy mayor from 2001 to 2019 and was elected mayor in October 2019. As well as his council commitments, Tim is involved in a number of other governance roles and is uh, also uh, involved in coaching rugby and supporting his sons in their sporting endeavors. Next is Councillor Kate Fulton, uh, who was elected to Nelson City Council in 2010 and Kate currently chairs the Environment and Climate Committee. She has worked hard in her role as a councillor to advocate for meaningful change in response to the climate crisis. She believes that a holistic approach is required which fosters regenerative economic models. She also believes that alongside biodiversity restoration, creating food systems which protect our local environment 
and nurture human health is one of the most important steps we can take as kaitiaki. I want to introduce Rachel Pemberton, who is the climate change manager at Nelson City Council. She's been working on climate change for the past 12 years in a range of roles, helping to establish Generation Zero. Uh, Rachel worked as private secretary to Honourable James Shaw throughout the development of the Zero Carbon Bill and as climate change policy manager at the Ministry for the Environment. Before joining council in December last year, Rachel led the team working on the emissions reduction plan. Thank you, Rachel. Diana Worthy is a senior policy planner in the environmental policy team at Tasman District Council. Diana has over 18 years of planning experience working for local government in New Zealand and Scotland and leads the Natural Hazards Policy Planning Work Program. Diana is also the project lead for the Council's Coastal Management Project. And Anna Geraghty is Senior Policy Advisor in the Strategic Policy Team at Tasman District Council. Anna coordinates Council's Climate Change Work Program and leads a team of 12 staff across the Council to implement the Tasman Climate Action Plan. She also reviews reserve management plans, is a member of the long-term plan project team and is on Council's Jobs for Nature project board. Okay, um, off we go. Let's see how many of the uh, approximately 10 questions we can get through before we switch to participants' questions mm -hmm. at around 8.45, 8.25, sorry. Um, starting with uh, what, what is in place now? So at last, we at a, at a national level, we have the emissions reduction plan and we have a national adaptation plan. Uh, and now we have the um, planning from Hewaka Eke Noa. Um, these plans point out the important role of local government in response to the climate crisis. Can you briefly outline what you already have in place in these areas? And we'll start with NCC for this one. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Uh, Tenakoto, uh, everyone who's here tonight, it would be lovely to be having this in person and see all your faces. Um, it's hard for me to see everyone and see my notes as well, but um, I'm sure you, hopefully you can all hear me clearly and um, it's really great that uh, we've managed to have a climate action week and bring in a hybrid model where we have some in person and some uh, Zoom meetings as well. Um, so as most of you uh, should know, um, Nelson City Council declared a climate emergency in 2019. Uh, prior to that, um, We'd been working really hard and trying to get climate change into uh, the long-term plan and into a lot of our AMPs, but, and we had developed our sustainability strategy, the Vision 2060 back in 2011, I think that was. So we had thought about climate change a lot, but it was more on the periphery. And as a uh, councillor who was trying to lead that charge, it was somewhat frustrating, but it was often an afterthought rather than the centre thought in terms of our responses to things. So since that emergency, um, we have been building climate change into our um, key council documents. Uh, we cast a climate change lens over our long-term plan and the tip our EHU intergenerational strategy also has a um, strong uh, theme around climate change. Um, we've adopted our national, uh, national 2050 targets and emissions budgets in line with, uh, we've adopted our own uh, emissions budgets in line with the national uh, 2050 targets. And we have developed a climate action plan, which sets out the projects that we are already doing in terms of um, funding and planning to do them. And they'll come up again during the webinar. And currently we have uh, 
um, fantastic new member of staff, Rachel Pemberton, and we're working closely on developing the strategic framework for climate change. This was a piece of work which I thought had started um, three years ago, but we have now in full, full charge ahead getting this piece of work done, which is really exciting. Um, Rachel uh, shares a really similar um, visionary thinking to mine. She's worked closely with James Dewar in the past, so, so our, we have a strong alignment and it's really uh, great to see her picking that up and able to communicate that at a senior level uh, within staff as well and support staff to understand how important this is holistically. I'm going to hand over to Rachel to comment briefly on that because um, Rachel, the, the council works in many different streams and climate change crosses all of them. So, so removing some of that sort of silo thinking has been a, a really hard part of the last three years. And I think we're making progress now, Rachel. Thanks, Kate. I think, yeah, your response is really comprehensive and thanks for your kind comments. Um, I'll just add that, uh, so as Joanna mentioned at the beginning, um, it's a real privilege from, for me coming from a central government background, having worked on a number of national policies, to then see that come through to, to local government and um, be in the position to try and where we're trying to get our heads around what it all means and um, to provide some kind of direction and certainty for, for our communities. Um, and it's awesome to come into a, a, a role where council has been really active in climate change and is really, this is a really strong and important area for the Nelson City Council. So um, I feel like I have a lot of um, backing to, to go forth and, um, and work with the likes of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum, Business for Climate Action, um, to build on the the work that's been done to, to date. Thank you very much. Anna, um, we uh, want to see Anna in response uh, for TDC. Uh, kia ora koutou. It's lovely to be here tonight. Um, so similar to Nelson, we also have been considering the effects of climate change in our work program for many years now. But back in 2019, in September, we adopted our first Tasman Climate Action Plan, and we've been working really hard to implement that over the past three years. Um, the main aims are to drive reductions in council emissions. It's quite a council-focused plan at this, you know, it was our first step um, to improve resilience, enhance leadership, and provide information to the community. Um, uh, the action plan also emphasizes the need to work together to ensure that, as a community, we're prepared to and ready to adapt to our ever-changing environment. We set out um, goals, targets and actions in that plan relating to the, uh, three key themes, so mitigation, adaptation and leadership. And, um, sorry, <laughs> reading my notes, old school styles. Uh, we have four goals which represent the long-term aspiration of council, so that's, that we contribute to New Zealand's effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that we become more resilient to the impacts of climate change, we're better informed about climate change actions and options for response, and that the council itself shows clear leadership on climate change issues. We've divided our, um, each goal has a number of targets and associated actions, and they were kind of over a 10 year period. Um, and we've divided up responsibility for ensuring each action is implemented between the, our 12 uh, staff members across council who uh, just, try to, if they're not directly responsible for the action themselves, they, they try to encourage the people who are to actually make sure we stay on track and meet those targets. We report on these quarterly um, to our strategy and policy committee, and then annually in a more detailed report, and those are on our website under climate change if you're interested in reading those. Um, due to the rapidly evolving legislative context, we're already looking to review our plan. Um, so in the next, uh, oh, the, so this month and next month, I have a couple of workshops with councillors where we're going to brainstorm ideas. Um, and the aim is to try to finalise a plan by April or May next year so that we can allocate draft LTP budget to it. Um, yeah, so that's thank you. Stage. Thank you very much, Anna. We turn now to adaptation um, as, as the... Um, as we now know, we're not de we're dealing not only with sea level rise, but also land subsidence. 
uh, and other, other climate impact risks like fire and flood. And, and alongside this, adaptation to the transformation of a to a low or zero carbon economy. And all of this adaptation is, is a pretty challenging demand on councils. Where is your council at this time in community consultation, risk appraisal, and decision making? And what's ahead in this arena? And let's start with Tim on this one. Tenna Kote Kato. Thanks very much, Joanna, for the opportunity to come along and uh, speak. And as I guess you'll notice, we're sharing between the three three of us uh, different different items. And obviously, at the end, when people ask questions, we'll um, uh, cover those accordingly. So, so adaptation is a key focus for councils, uh, and I guess it's a key focus for a number of reasons. One is it's one of the things that we have more control over than mitigation. Um, as a country and as a region, we're a tiny percentage. And we can do a great job of mitigation and mitigate and our country can meet our obligations, we will still have to adapt if the rest of the world doesn't manage to achieve their objectives. So adaptation is a key focus. We involve that involves a lot of consultation across a lot of different items. The two key ones in terms of community feedback and input are the Tasman Environment Plan, which sets out the overall approach that we take to managing all of the challenges and environmental issues. And we are at an early stage of a 10 year review process of that plan. And the second key document is the long term plan. And as Anna's touched on, that involves where funding is attached to different initiatives that cover a wide range of the activities that us as unitary authorities, both Nelson and ourselves, um, as both our regional council and territorial council functions. So they are the two key ones. However, there's a huge amount of other processes that uh, have either direct or indirect implications and involve community input. I'm sure many of you on this call are aware and have been involved with and submitted to the FDS around the future growth uh, in the region. Uh, there is the walking and cycling strategy, there are regular plan changes, and so all of these involve a degree of community input consultation uh, and ultimately decision making. So as a region, uh, Joanna touched on the fact that we tend to focus, I guess, on the big impacts, the events, the, the Pigeon Valley fires, the cyclone, Fahies and Geetas, uh, the flooding events. But in many ways, it's the, it's the more, I guess, consistent and long-term changes that are presenting or will present significant challenges. So drier years, um, warmer winters. Uh, we've developed an economy largely based on primary production that relies on quite specific, um, particularly for crops like hops, so where we are, our, our, our mix of winters and summer temperatures, if they change significantly over time, um, they present as many risks, those long-term incremental changes, as the more intensive uh, and more frequent events that we might face in terms of floods, fires, and cyclones. Now, as a region, we've always been subject to those. Uh, the concern is that they're gonna become more frequent uh, and potentially uh, ha have larger impacts. So council has a lot of processes in place uh, that involve community consultation. Unfortunately, um, they also take time. And so that remains a challenge for people um, to both stay involved, to get across the breadth of things. And that's combined with the massive amount of consultation that central government's doing uh, and the implications of the various reforms that they're also considering at the same time. Uh, and obviously one of the big big of those is the latest climate adaptation plan to which we've just completed a submission, uh, which I presume Anna was, is public um, or, or certainly will be for people to see our feedback into that process as well. So there is an awful lot going on. Uh, sometimes it appears as is perhaps too many processes and too much to input to, uh, but in some ways that just reflects the environment that we have to work in. And I, th I think you um, would like to turn to Diana to supplement that, that information, is that so right? Diana is going to focus specifically on some of the work around coastal hazards, sea level rise, um, which is obviously very pertinent at the moment. And also on the point that you raised earlier about both the sea level rising and the uh, land subsidence issues. Uh, thanks, Tim, and thanks, Joanna, and yeah, kia ora koutou. It's great to be here tonight um, to talk about 
coastal management project, which I'm the project lead for. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to um, share my screen if I can, although, um, sorry, I seem to have misplaced my presentation. Um, Marlene, no. are you able to share the slide? I've got it, yeah. Ah, cool, thank you. Um, so I've just put together a couple of slides here around the coastal management project. So Council launched this back in 2019 and it's focusing on um, working with our community, the Tasman community, around developing a long-term adaptive plan for coastal hazards and sea level rise. Uh, like the rest of New Zealand, um, you know, we have experienced and will continue to experience the impact of coastal hazards. I know Tim uh, talked about ex-tropical cyclone Fahey, which happened back in 2018, and that was a significant event for us. And with climate change, we'll expect to see these type of events happen uh, more frequently and more severe. And in addition to this, obviously, with climate change, we'll experience sea level rise. So while council has considered natural hazards and sea level rise in our decision-making processes for a number of years, um, it's really important that we you know, continue to take this into effect and work with our communities because it's very much a case of the decisions that we are making today will affect our children, grandchildren and those future communities. And on the right hand side of my slide here, you, you can see in terms of, you know, the decisions and the, the lifetime of those impacts that we make around those decisions. So with the house, well, the building act uh, suggests that it should be able to withstand 50 years. We would like to think that our new houses will could last between 80 to 100 years plus. With infrastructure pipes, they have the average lifespan of 80 years, uh, road infrastructure, between you know, 50 and 100 years. And then decisions around new permanent roads and also subdivision, you know, those are permanent decisions that we're making. So we'll go on to the next slide. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Um, so as I said, we started this project back in 2019. And the key thing in here is it was an opportunity to bring together existing council teams and the work we were individually doing to pull it together in a coordinated fashion and then work with our communities. And so we're following the Ministry for the Environment's Coastal Hazards and Climate Change Guidance. And that came out back in 2017. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, and it's a 10-step decision-making process that focuses on five questions. And so those questions are, what's happening? What matters most? What, we, what can we do about it? And so that is the stage our council's at. How can we implement the strategy and how is it working? So we'll go on to the next slide. And... That answers that first question around what is happening. So back in 2019, we released our Coastal Hazards Map Viewer. It's on our website. I encourage you to have a look at it if you haven't already. And that demonstrates um, looking at coastal hazards. So that's historical rates of erosion, as well as looking at coastal storm tides and increments of sea level rise up to two meters. And at that time we did community engagement and it was very much an, an education process to say, you know, these are what are the hazards in our community. This is what sea level rise is going to look like in terms of those areas of low lying vulnerable coastal land. And then tell us the things that you value that might be in these areas that will be affected by these hazards. And so we'll go on to the next slide. And so following on from our mapping, we then looked at that question around what matters most. And so in December 2020, we completed our coastal risk assessment. And basically what the risk assessment does is it looks at the areas of that sea level rise and coastal storm tide mapping, and then identifies what are the things that we value that are in those areas that could be vulnerable. And so we've broadly followed the methodology that was used for the national climate risk assessment. And it puts this information into these four different categories. 
So for the human category, we looked at census data and worked out, uh, you know, how the size of the population that could be affected within these areas, cultural heritage, protected trees, things like that. With the natural environment, we looked at the land cover database, uh, some of our resource management plan zonings, uh, significant natural areas, what's affected there. And then with the economy, again, it was looking at some of the plan zonings, land cover database. And with the built environment, it was you know, counting how many buildings are in these areas, uh, number of kilometers of road that's affected or pipes and things like that. Um, so that risk assessment is also available on our website. And I'm sure Rachel and Kate will probably talk about it um, when we get to them, but the councils are currently looking to do um, a joint uh, climate change risk assessment for the Nelson Tasman area. So this coastal one, I suppose, is a small part of that, and we'll be looking at a much broader scale in terms of what are the wider climate change risks. And then in terms of my next slide, thanks Marlene. We're currently at this phase where we're looking at um, what can we do about it. So last year between September and October, we went out to the community and it was very much a, an education process talking about what are the high level options for coastal management. And you can see it falls into four broad categories of accommodate, protect, avoid and retreat. And so those come out of the MFE guidance um, and it was very much a case of raising awareness and just developing a common understanding on those broad options. And so we asked the community, you know, tell us what you think around these options. And so there's a feedback report that's also available on our website. And the next step here will now be to look at those options at the local level. But we have to be very much mindful that we're currently in this process of Resource Management Act reform, obviously the Climate Adaptation Act that's coming through in this draft national adaptation plan uh, will be key drivers in terms of where we go next with this discussion with the community. So I think I'll probably leave it here at the moment. Thanks, Marlene. Thank you very much, you. Diana. Uh, um, let's ask um the uh, ask the ncc people if you want to further comment on on this <coughs> question. I'll jump in there um diana and tim did a great job of covering the context and um what tdc is doing and that aligns very closely with what we're doing so i'll just kind of add to their response um so we've at, at nelson city council spent the last few years building up our understanding of climate change risks and how, how we'll impact the city um, and its people, its infrastructure, our economy. Um, we held a workshop last year with scientists, government agencies and other experts to understand these risks and the vulnerabilities of um, different parts of our community to, to climate change. Um, in two weeks time, we are about to engage with the community. Um, so we're at, at the stage between um, identifying, if, if you remember from Diana's slide, um, identifying what matters most to, to then, um, and also um, working out what options are available to us. So uh, in a couple of weeks time, we'll be sending letters to around 6,000 households over, over Nelson who are gonna be affected by up to 1.5 metres of sea level rise and by flooding of the Maitai River. Um, and that letter is going to invite them to participate in a series of workshops where um, we'll talk through the impacts of climate change on particular parts of the city. Um, and we're going to seek feedback on what the community um, thinks is important to achieve through our adaptation response. Through that, that engagement, we're also going to be presenting the high level options that, that Diana um, mentioned before um, and getting an early indication of um, whether there's kind of any, any preferences or um, any, um, any um, adaptation options that people have been considering. We're, we're not in a position to be able to decide on particular options yet because um, as, as Tim mentioned, there's a lot of work underway at a national level, the National Adaptation Plan but significantly the climate change adaptation sorry the climate adaptation act um which will provide much needed tools on um on things like managed retreat and also um 
hopefully should provide us with some more concrete answers to how the costs will be apportioned between local government, between central government, insurers, banks, private um, property owners, etc. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to the engagement in a couple of weeks time. Um, following this, this engagement period, we're um, going to develop a set of objectives that will guide our future adapt adaptation planning. Um, and then we'll look at um, specific options for specific parts of the city and then come back to the community to, to talk about that. Um, over the next couple of years, we'll also be looking at um, other climate change risks, such as drought, um, fire, flooding of, of rivers that, that um, other than the Mai Tai, because the Mai Tai is included in our current, our, our engagement plan in June. Um, and we'll be building that into um, our adaptation strategy as well. Kate, do you want to add anything? Yes, I'll just add briefly. Look, I think that uh, there's been a very um, good summary. I think I was told I was only allowed to speak for one minute, but I'm not sure that that's possible. <laughs> um, but I'll do my best, Joanna. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to add in from a governance lens, and, and I do understand that the community perhaps feels quite frustrated that it, it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of talk, which for me personally feels like it's the same. It's the same. How are we going to adapt? What are we going to do? How, when are we going to consult with the community? And, it's, and it seems very small steps in, in progressing our thinking. Um, I think for me personally, mitigation is a far more urgent issue for us to be addressing. We have eight years to address mitigation globally. Uh, Mayor Tim is absolutely right. We can do lots around adaptation and within our own regions, but in terms of our mitigation, what we do now and in the next eight years will really, really um, shape what our future cities are gonna look like in 150 years. So it's really important the community remembers that and supports our councils to prioritize mitigation um, mitigation um, attempts and mitigation action first of all and secondly I think I really like to think about mitigation and adaptation um, as a dual approach you can be quite sure that councils will spend money on the infrastructure infrastructure to adapt we we have to protect our roads we have to protect our rivers we have all sorts of regulations which will ensure that people can live in cities, we might have to learn to live with water and with fire and um, climate change in different ways, but vast sums of money will be invested into adaptation. The opportunity to create resilient cities whereby you sequester carbon whilst adapting, for example, creating living drains or planting more trees and bushes along your waterways, which act as uh, carbon sinks and act as water sinks, is, is really, really great. So there's a lot we can do be doing in the adaptation arena, which is also in the mitigation arena. And that goes to greening our cities as well. We can make our cities cooler for the future by planting more trees. Um, and, uh, and, and so in many ways, I like to think about adaptation and mitigation as sitting alongside each other and how do we mitigate and adapt at the same time. Um, there's been a lot of comments in the comment box about why is Nelson City Council uh, proposing to build a library uh, along the river when we're also developing an adaptation plan. And I am gonna just take a minute to respond to that now because I'm not sure if it comes up again later. And I know it's a question which comes up over and over again. Um, I think it's really important to understand that at a governance level, we make decisions based on the evidence based science we have in the room at the time. Um, the science of climate change is really, really complicated and it's always changing. It's a little bit like COVID, but it's a long-term change. And so the decisions you make in the chamber, you have to make based on the science that you're presented with at the time. And there is an element of trust in your engineers who have maybe spent 400 hours doing their research and doing their modelings. And there's an evidence of trust. Um, and there's a, there's a need to trust that, that your staff are doing their best to understand the situation and that we would not invest that kind of money in the infrastructure of our city if we thought we shouldn't be. Now that might change based on new science because science is constantly changing, but at this point in time, the cost to benefit analysis shows that it's better to invest in our city than to move our entire city or move our port 
or move rocks road walking and cycling away and, and sort of abandon our city, which is what I think some people are seeking that we do. So at this point in time, the science suggests to us that we can build um, in innovative ways, just like they have built for earthquakes in Wellington and in Christchurch, and that we can build strategically and that our CBD is has enough values to us and that the river has enough value to us that we want to stay in that area. It has high value to Iwi and we also have a lot of other buildings around that library site including um, Kayanga Aura's uh, intentions to build inner city living and the science and innovation precinct. So you can be quite sure that the buildings will not be built unless the engineers have done their jobs and made sure that they are building resiliently. Um, and and I, in my role at a governance level, I can only make a decision based on the reports that I have at hand. Thank you, Kate. Um, adaptation needed to be a, a longer discussion and uh, we, we, we did need to spend time on that. But I, I will ask, if, if possible, as we proceed to, to try, it, it'd be good to get through quite a lot of our questions if we can. Um, so uh, if, if you can be, people can be somewhat succinct, not, not too cramped. But anyway, we're on to mitigation now, um, that we are expected um, to reduce to 61 megatons on average per year nationally in the emissions budget period 2026 to 2030 uh, from about 82 megatons a year now. We've got to bring it a big step down. We also need to halve our emissions nationally to meet our nationally determined contribution by 2030. What are the goals of your council in emissions reduction and do you have any goals in sequestration? And I'm pretty interested in the 2030 marker here. Uh, the starter here is, is uh, NCC. I think we've broadly covered this already, so I can be brief. Um, so as Kate mentioned earlier, um, Nelson City Council has adopted the National Emissions Reduction Target for 2050 um, as its own operational emissions um, target. So that's uh, a net zero for all gases except biogenic methane and 40, uh, sorry, 24 to 47% um, reduction in biogenic methane by 2050. Um, councils also adopted um, the, the national emissions budgets levels. And now that we've got the those um, those were released about a month ago, we can work out proportionally what's Nelson's share of um, the emissions budget. Um, and we're aiming to progressively reduce this in line with the emissions budgets over time. So that's really the closest thing we have to a 2030 goal because those emissions budgets are for 2026, 2030, 2031, um, sorry, 2021 to 2025, 2026 to 2030 and 2031 to 2035. Um, so we can we can almost arrive at kind of point in time target target through that. And um, we're also looking to set uh, an, an emissions reduction target for Nelson's emissions um, because um, we believe that there's more opportunities than just reducing council's own emissions from its operations by working with the community, by working with um, Nelson Tasman Climate Forum, Business of Climate Action, et cetera. Um, so that is a, a piece of work that would be done through the strategic framework for climate change. Um, and there's a report going up to committee on the 16th of June um, on the strategic framework for climate change. Thank you, Rachel. Um, shall we turn to Anna for TDC's response to this? Yep, so in our um, action plan, we have a goal relating to, which I mentioned before, that we council contributes to New Zealand's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we have four different targets. So the first one relates to the government goals that they put in the zero carbon bill. So council emissions of methane reduced by, by 10% below 2017 levels by the year 2030 and 47% by 2050 or earlier. 
and then Council's net emissions of all other greenhouse gases reduced to zero by 2050. Um, our second target is that council decisions for planning and infrastructure design support private individuals and business to reduce their emissions by 80% by 2050. Um, our third target, year-on-year -year use of alternative transport modes increases, whereas use of single occupancy internal combustion engine vehicles on roads in our district um, declines. And our fourth target, use of active transport, i.e. walking and cycling, as a form of transportation, increases year on year. And those goals are actually um, expanded on more in our recently adopted walking cycling strategy now. Um, in relation to sequestration, our action plan does have a couple of uh, actions. One is to continue to invest in our forest plantations and participate in the Emissions Trading Scheme program and explore opportunities to plant carbon forests on council land, e.g. river berm land or other land we own. Um, and the second one, to continue to work with communities to plant trees, e.g. along riparian margins, habitat enhancement, land stability, and planting in council's parks and reserves, um, and possibly within some roading corridors to expand our council nursery production in order to sequester carbon. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Continue to support and facilitate landowner applications to central government funds, such as the Bullion Tree Fund. Um, yeah, and so we were lucky to receive a lot of funding through the Jobs for Nature money that government um, dished out in the last couple of years. And we have several, like the Waimea Inlet Project, Wetlands Project, um, the Pidger Valley Fire Project, um, all are planting several thousands of trees, hundreds of thousands of trees. And we, we provide advice to the Mootry Catchment Project that's run by Landcare Trust, where they're also providing 270,000 trees planting, sorry. Yeah, so and in terms of the 2030 goal, we don't have any official goals for that just yet, but that's something that our review of the climate action plan could potentially look at. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. T T Tasman area does a lot of sequestration for the entire nation. Okay. Um, any sequestration goals in, in NCC? Would you like me to go, Rachel? Um, I'm, I, Rachel has the most beautifully prepared notes, but I'm sorry, I can't find find that question. Is it at the end towards, have you just skipped a question? Um, no, no, that, that's part of the, um, the mitigation, question three mitigation. Oh, okay, all right, great. Okay, so yeah, so um, NCC was also really uh, successful in getting some of the Jobs for Nature um, sequestration uh, or uh, Jobs for Nature funding through the COVID emergency response. And so we have a lot of trees being planted as well. Um, we haven't yet been able to measure that I'm aware of how uh, and quantitatively how many tons of um, carbon we're sequestering, but there is, qualitative data to show that we can offset our emissions using that approach. Tasman probably has a lot more land than NCC does, but, um, but it is something which I would expect to see coming through um, in the reporting more and more. So you should be able to uh, look at if, if there's a project which the community really wants to deliver, something like, um, they, they did it for the artificial soccer turf, they figured out how many trees would have to be planted in order to mitigate for that project. And it was a significant number. And I think that project is now on hold. Um, but likewise, you could be doing that with a project which involves a lot of concrete. Um, so we should be able to uh, begin to mitigate uh, projects which are important to us, to our community in the future. Okay. Uh, Rachel, have you got anything you wanted to add to that? No, that's great. Thanks, Kate. On to transport, and here Tim gets the first go. The transport's a big one for councils, and can you say something about what you've done in this area and what you're planning to do and by when? And can you project what emission savings you'll aim to achieve? 
Okay, again, I guess a lot of this cuts across or covers both of us. So a lot of this is being joint work and clearly it's also supported um, through uh, Waka Qatar here, their investment in both public and active transport. And this is one of the areas where I think both councils are potentially spending a lot of money. Uh, and it's also one of the areas where we have the most direct ability to influence changes in behavior um, and encourage uh, mode shift. So the two key focuses of public transport uh, and active transport, i.e. walking and cycling. And Anna mentioned the walking and cycling strategy previously. I think the combined investment for Tasman District Council over the next 10 years and the combination of those two is about $50 million. And that's split um, uh, about two thirds, one third uh, active transport versus public transport. And the reason that active transport is a bigger investment is in relation to the whole construction side of building um, cycling and walking activities, uh, which is a more expensive capital investment than public transport is. So uh, we have a, a big focus on public transport in terms of extending the public transport network from uh, Richmond out to some of the outlying areas, the Brightwaters, the Wakefields, the Mortar Wakers uh, over the 10 year period. Uh, and trying to, and, and this is one of the challenges, we have a very low current mm. uptake of public transport, roughly 1%. So even doubling that, which is our target, only takes that to 2%. Um, but that is still going to be a significant challenge in, the, in a region like this. So that is one big focus. Uh, the Richmond program business case, which is in uh, Waka Katahi's approach to the area that most people will be aware of from Three Brothers Corner through the lights at Lower Queen Street, um, through to the boundary with Nelson City Council, um, has park and ride facilities as part of that overall approach um, to public transport and also to active transport as well. The active transport um, is, a, I think, quite a, a, um, a stretch target in terms of trying to shift uh, where we get 60% of people who live in urban areas uh, to be travelling to work or school by walking and cycling, 40% by 2030, uh, and 60% by 2050. Currently, that figure sits around 19%, and that is largely made up of people accessing school. So that is a, a real challenge um, and something that we're investing a significant amount of both capital investment and, and obviously education and encouragement in trying to achieve. Uh, the government's policy is clearly to encourage a shift to um, EV, e electric vehicles, and that was evident in the budget that was recently announced and also follows through in their climate adaptation planning. Uh, and that's what drives our approach and our belief that we can reduce um, emissions from transport and meet the requirements uh, by the 2050 target. And that's against the background of a rapidly growing region. So one of our challenges across all of these emissions targets is that we are working almost against um, a rapidly growing population. So that presents some particular challenges. So we do expect to be able to meet those targets. Our, our um, aiming to achieve reducing our transport emissions, as I said, um, down to that net zero uh, percentage by 2050. So that would be reducing our current emissions from 240,000 tonnes of carbon equivalent uh, down to zero. That is based on, and I know there is a degree of scepticism about our ability to achieve that, the Ministry of Transports and the government's assumptions that 97% of vehicles in New Zealand will be EV by 2050. And again, we have to work on some basis. How real that is, you know, obviously there's a, a, a degree of uh, debate about a lot of these targets, how achievable they are, but that is what our expectation is. Thank you, Tim. As a motorway, and the public transport can't come soon enough for me. And we love your walking and cycling strategy. It's really good. On to NCC on transport. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, so as transport is one of the largest sources of our, well, it's in fact the largest source of household emissions in um, Nelson and in Tasman, it's a huge opportunity for Nelson um, to, to, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so as Tim mentioned, we do a lot of our work with TDC um, and also with Waka Kutahi um, on transport policies, including on the Regional Land Transport Plan. Over the last 15 years, Nelson has been building a, a separated cycle network to support active travel, um, for example, the Mai Tai Path and Artify Drive. This has resulted in approximately 19% of journeys to work and school being undertaken by active modes. 
with 60% of students at Broad Green Intermediate already regularly cycling to school due to the um, location of the railway reserve close by. This has formed the basis of um, for investigating more facilitate investing in more facilities to encourage greater use of active modes. Over the last five years, we've been developing a more sustainable approach to transport planning to ensure it is integrated with land use planning across the region. We're focusing on mode shift, um, so shifting away from private vehicle use to, um, to uh, active forms of, um, of transport and public transport. We're currently working to the following targets, 25% reduction in vehicle kilometres travelled by 2035 um, compared to 2019 numbers and doubling the proportion of people walking and cycling to work and school by 2030. There are a number of building blocks that support, support this, including um, the Nelson Future Access Study, um, which was adopted in 2021, and it recommended making better use of our existing road network um, to accommodate the travel needs of an increasing population. The 2021 Regional Public Transport Plan was developed and adopted to increase uh, public transport and the public transport network in Nelson and Tasman. This includes both increasing the network coverage to include rural Tasman and increase in frequency on all routes. And this change, this change is currently out for tender and will be initiated in um, July 2023. There's also some changes planned to Nelson routes to provide better coverage um, and a shift to low emissions and zero emissions um, buses. Uh, and finally, there's also better infrastructure planned in terms of passenger vehicle, um, passenger facilities, sorry, um, including bus stops and bus hubs, um, as well as technology, um, for example, real-time information provided at key bus stops to encourage use. Um, in addition, a flat fare will be introduced on urban services, and um, this is, this is um, complementing nicely gov central government's announcement to halve the prices of um, all community fairs. Um, so at the moment that's available to everyone and from August they'll be available just to community services card holders. And that's just a selection. There's many other transport proposals and um, so I'm happy to talk about more of them if people have questions. Thank you, Rachel. We have time only for one more of my questions before we um, give everybody else a go. So I, I, will, I will just carry on in order. Um, waste is, it figures prominently in every council's own emissions profile. And of course the problem belongs to all of us, um, not just councils. So what is your council planning to do about waste emissions and especially organic waste? And again, are you able to project the emissions savings pretty succinctly and starting with NCC. I had allocated this question to myself, but I might give it to Kate if that's all right, because um, I know this is oh, sure. a question that's close to Kate's heart. Sure, sure, yeah. Kate, are you happy Kate. to answer? Uh, are you there, Kate? I, could, uh, I, I, I think she's, uh, she's not there anymore. Um, oh, okay, I'll jump in, that's all good. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully she'll be back soon. And um, so waste is one sort of source of emissions where our um, community can make a really big impact. So waste contributes only a small proportion to our overall emissions profile, so around 4%. Um, but there's huge opportunities to, um, to reduce emissions if you think more broadly about waste um, and our make, take, dispose culture. We are collaborating with Tasman District Council through our shared waste management and minimization plan. Um, our landfills are jointly owned by NCC and TEDC, um, and our team's doing a great job of reducing emissions by improving greenhouse gas collection infrastructure. And we're also about to start the review of our shared waste minimization, sorry, waste management and minimization plan with TDC. Um, so this is an ideal opportunity to consider um, how to, to help New Zealand transition to a low waste and circular economy. We have the Rethink Waste um, Fakaroa Rohia program, which focuses on enabling our community to avoid or reduce waste, as well as curbside recycling and a public drop-off at our waste recovery centre and um, other activities. We support include helping households compost, worm farm or bokashi through subsidies and education, 
as well as subsidizing the costs of dropping off green waste at a waste recovery center, keeping e-waste out of landfill and recovering valuable resources through supporting e-cycling and offering free drop-offs for batteries. Using waste minimization grants to enable community-led projects such as repair cafes, um, reducing waste and building community skills. Nurturing a culture of reuse through activities such as Secondhand Sunday and our op shop maps. And finally, um, another initiative is developing new programs to help uh, the building sector reduce and divert construction demolition waste away from landfills. And this is gonna be a focus of the coming year. We, we thank you for the help with the repair cafes, Rachel. That's really helpful. Anna, um, do you want to say something about TDC and, and uh, waste? Uh, we're actually very similar um, because we sh share, you know, a lot of those with our joint um, business unit, um, managing waste for both regions. So um, the only extra things I'd add is just that in terms of methane emissions from landfills, um, so the Eaves Valley landfill that's in our district was closed, I think, in 2017, time, something like that. Um, and that is capped. So recently the old flare from the York Valley landfill was installed there and that is um, capturing and um, burning the gas. It converts it from methane to CO2, which is not ideal, but it's at least not as bad a um, greenhouse gas. Um, whereas at York Valley, the gas, a lot of it is um, captured and transmitted to the Nelson Hospital where it's used to help subsidize the heating requirements of the hospital. Um, and yeah, like Nelson, we are also trying to work more closely with the construction industry to divert construction waste. Um, and looking at some sort of regional facility for dealing with organic waste um, is it another big priority for us? I think that's the only extra things I wanted to say there. Okay, so thank I, you very I, much. Jo Joanna, just really briefly on the food waste, uh, which I think you touched on as part of the question. So it's, it's something I guess as a producer of food, um, I'm partic particularly passionate about. One third of all the food produced in the world is waste. Um, and I read a statistic today that said if it was a country, food waste would be the third highest emitter behind China and the USA. Mm. Um, and if you think of all the energy and effort that goes into producing it uh, and then shipping it and shifting it around the world, to have a third of it wasted is, is probably one of the biggest tragedies, regardless of whether it had an impact on climate, it's just a tragedy and on every other level. So one of the challenges is what to do to try and encourage that. And I am a little concerned that the answer, which currently is in front of us, which is, um, to collect that food and compost it in some ways is almost giving people, I guess, a, a bit of an indication that it's okay because it's all right, we're collecting it, we're gonna go and take and do something with it, which is better than it just going in a landfill, but it doesn't necessarily encourage what needs to happen, which is actually reducing waste in the first place. And that runs across a number of our strategies around recycling and trying to refocus the, the R's to the reduce because we put a lot of effort into recycling and reuse, which is great, but that actually ultimately is not going to achieve the outcome of 30% of food is being wasted and then we're just recycling a portion of it at the end. That's probably not the answer in the longer term. Shall I come in there, jo Joanna? I think I was about, about to turn to you, Kate, and, but also thanks, Tim. Uh, it, it's a huge area of, of emissions as, as well as a, an issue of social justice. So thank you for those words. And Kate, uh, we do want to hear from you about food. Yeah, sorry, I dropped out for a minute. Um, my computer lost the screen and then I accidentally unplugged it. So here I am ah. on my phone. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, can you hear me? All right. We can hear you and see you. It's fine. Great. Um, so, Tim, look, you raise a really, really valid um, comment around food waste and the fact that food should be eaten, not wasted. And that is a big, big part of the Good Food Cities initiatives of the Eat Lancet reports of what uh, the planetary diet should look like, that food should be eaten first and foremost. And that is what happens to... Uh, the parts of food systems which perhaps can't be eaten, such as the byproducts of viticulture, such as um, the outside leaves of a cauliflower, um, 
I'm thinking probably apples left over from making cider. So, so there's a lot of food waste which is comes from production of food and how can we decrease that food waste. At the moment, Nelson Environment Centre is really involved in diverting food from supermarkets and moving that into communities of, of need. And that is one way we do it, but ideally we should be ensuring that the food we also grow and produce in our country um, is nutritious and healthy and getting to the families most in need in terms of that fresh fruit and vegetable supply. So certainly the initiative around diverting food waste from landfill is very much about composting food waste, which has to go to, has to be composted rather than um, composting edible food. Um, I think that's really important. People understand that that's a big part of that um, driving force around food resiliency. The second part of food resiliency is the opportunity to divert the food waste from landfill and then turn it into compost to grow more food in. And so the concept around growing your food in the compost produced from food allows for particularly urban environments, uh, home gardens, schools, uh, businesses to be producing more of their food locally. So you're decreasing the food miles, you're increasing the affordability of healthy and nutritional food into the community. And it also really improves well-being as well as physical health. It improves well-being when people are close and connected to the food, to their food sources and to seasonal food. So, so there's a lot of co-benefits when we look at climate change and food resiliency, um, which is perhaps why there's been a big push globally to say, if we look at our food systems, and improve our food systems, we can really tackle climate change, plus tackle food poverty, plus improve the health of either undernourished countries or countries which are overnourished. Um, and the best paper, if anyone's interested, the best paper I've seen on it is on the Eat Lancet Journal. There was a large collaboration of scientists who really spent a lot of time thinking about global food systems and what they should look like. And, in terms of our regional part we can play, we can play a part at an urban level, we can play a part at a rural level, and as a country, we have committed to playing that part in terms of that regenerative agriculture movement. Um, and finally, I just wanted to make the point that in terms of consumption, if you think about a future where we consume a lot less of other things, hopefully we buy clothes made to last, we buy more secondhand clothes, we buy a computer which will last us 10 years rather than, or a phone which lasts us a long time. So as we consume less, our biggest buying power becomes through the food that we choose to eat. So if we can choose to spend our money on local food systems, then we're also supporting that local economy. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a big passion of mine. And I really think we can uh, transform our food systems as a country and regionally in really positive ways. That was a good summary of a big subject, Kate. And I, I want to endorse your recommendation of the Eat Lancet paper, a very important piece of, of work on, on that issue. I'm very eager to open up questions to everyone. Let me just remind you how questions, uh, Marlene, I hope, can um, give, us, give us the full gallery screen. And um, the idea is to use your uh, going to to the reactions icon at the bottom, and and uh, and just uh, clicking on raise hand. And when your question's answered, uh, lower hand. And so I will go first to Jan Hayes, who uh, has had his hand up from 7.30 p.m. actually. <laughs> Must be getting tired, yeah? So ask your question, please. Uh, thanks, Joanna, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I've got a whole lot of questions, but uh, let's, let's just start with one, and maybe I get an opportunity to ask a few others. Um, there is general consensus in the science that sprawl is significantly more harmful looking at um, climate emissions than, uh, than compared to intensification. I'm aware of an officer's report related to the development, future development strategy that, if, that in fact denies the science. They come up with 
what I would call a Mickey Mouse calculation showing that's actually neutral. It doesn't matter whether you sprawl or not. So do Nelson and Tesman conclude that the science related to sprawl is not true or not important enough looking at the very high percentage of sprawl proposed? Uh, Tim, please, and then Nelson. Uh, so I guess I, I take it your question relates to the transport emissions and the calculations that have been done over um, different scenarios in terms of still trying to arrive at the same point in 2050. Uh, so if Drew's on the line, so he might like to speak in more detail. I think one of the challenges is the assumptions that you make about where people live and where people work. Um, I've got to be a bit careful because clearly the uh, FDS is currently being considered for decision making and councils will have to consider the recommendations that come back from that working party. So I think the council staff were laying out um, a, a, their advice uh, and their view of the science. And I take it that you know a lot of these are contested. So um, Drew can speak to the particulars, but depending on where people live and where people work and how they travel, I think it's important to recognize that just building intensification in a place like Richmond or more importantly, right in Nelson, when a lot of those people may work rurally, you're just reversing their transport decisions. Um, they aren't necessarily all going to work in the place where you provide intensification. Intensification for both councils is a key area of focus that we both support, encourage, and are um, both allowing for, providing for, and also um, try to uh, do more than that to encourage. So I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that we don't support intensification, that we're not trying to encourage it, that we're not trying to incentivize it. Um, however, we are trying to find a balance between housing choices and meeting our obligations under the National Policy Statement for Urban Development to ensure there is capacity for um, the population that we're anticipating. Does NCC want to comment on, on uh, Jan's question about sprawl intensification? Yeah, I can comment really briefly. Um, I'm not on the FDS uh, panel, and so I haven't followed the hearings uh, closely. Um, I know Tim, near Tim, you have, and his many, many, many hours of listening and careful deliberating of, of where you can land. I, I think for me, um, we live in a country where um, people want to live in cities and people want to live rurally. And what's really important is, to me is the kinds of houses we're building for the future. So uh, whether we're creating small eco villages rurally where people don't have a need to get into their car for a week because everything's within walking and cycling of where they live or they're working off the land. As um, Mayor Tim pointed out, some people can work where they live even if, if they are living rurally. Um, and likewise, in our urban environments, um, intensification has to be done in a way which uh, really takes care of communities. So uh, green star rated buildings, which have a lot of sunshine and a lot of light and hopefully living walls and um, not too much concrete, although it's pretty hard to move away from concrete sometimes. So more timber. Uh, the airport's a really good example of a highly sustainable zero carbon building uh, has passive heating and cooling as well so no air conditioners uh, or um, electric heating in the winter I think that we really need to be thinking about uh, the energy and efficiency of the buildings we build and the size of the buildings we build for people to live in whether they can be smaller and therefore have a much smaller draw on the energy the um, network energy. So things like solar panels and water resiliency is really important as well. Rainwater tanks. In terms of your transport networks, um, I think we need to be mindful that increasingly a lot of people will work from home. Uh, people might work two or three or even four days from home. So it might be that people choose to only commute one or two days a week. And you're certainly seeing that happening up in Auckland you see people who choose to live in Nelson because they can work from home. So increasingly, if you can cut your transport emissions by 20% just from working from home one day a week and choosing not to get in your car, that's a big start. Um, and I'm just, and also I'm thinking that in Nelson, in terms of our intensification, 
we have a great opportunity to um, have electric bikes in quite a hilly city, but electric bikes or electric scooters are a great, great way for uh, our transport network to improve in a sustainable way. Um, so I am comfortable that there's a balance being sought and that uh, Nelson is trying to intensify as much as it can. And I really hope that uh, Tasman is thinking about how it can intensify its rural communities as well in ways which, um, which allow that village feel to occur. Thank you, Kate. Um, Nate is next, but I, um, Nate, just forgive me if I just check with um, Lindsay Wood, who I think may want to comment on the question that we're dealing with. And that, Lindsay, is that the case that you want to comment on this question? Well, I really, not really, thanks, Joanna. I'm happy okay. to comment very quickly on construction carbon, but I don't mm -hmm. think I need to right now, thank you. Okay, let me then go to Nate. <clears throat> Yeah, um, kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Nate. I'm a 14-year-old kind of climate activist and environmentalist from the Nelson Tasman region. Um, I just have a quick question for NCC because I know that Anna from TBC has been answering a lot of my questions. Um, you've probably seen this question in the chat quite a few times, but I was wanting to know if NCC are planning on consulting with youth about all of their climate action plans about mitigation and adaptation. Um, as I believe that this is something that should be happening, I think that councils definitely should be consulting and engaging with youth about their plans, as it is going to be something that is going to be dictating our future, all of the decisions that are made today, because climate action is going to be affecting you know our generation more than any other, in a sense. Um, so I think having opportunity for youth to have their say is something which should be quite important and I think that we do have really important and key things to say which um, will help you know decision makers. Thank you Nate. Thanks. NCC first and um, succinct answers please. Thanks Nate. Look NCC has a really strong youth council and our youth councillors sit at, sit at the table with us um, at our committee meetings. So um, youth council is constantly engaged at all levels of council. I think what's quite interesting is sometimes youth councillors can forget about climate change when they're being consulted with say over a youth park and what they want in the youth park. Um, so it's important that youth also bring that climate change voice to projects which are important to them. Um, but, but I'm comfortable that staff go to youth council and then youth council goes out to the youth in our community in, in a way that they want to survey. They'll generally survey before the long-term plan on questions that are important to them. I know they did that around climate change in the last long-term plan round. Can I just add, add to that if I can, um, just to add to Kate's response. And sorry, I switched my phone because my laptop died as well. Um, so... I, yeah, I absolutely think and agree with you, Nate, that youth, it's so important to involve youth in the development of um, climate change policies as youth are going to be the most affected by the policies that we that we make and by climate change. Um, so uh, going forward in the development of the strategic framework for climate change, I'd really like to engage with, with young people, um, potentially through schools or w whatever um, forum works really. Um, been uh, toying with the idea of ho holding a, a hui for young people um, to, to input into the council's um, strategic framework. All of this, of course, still has to be considered by council um, on the 16th of June. But um, yeah, I totally agree with what you what you said, Nate, that um, youth, youth voice is really critical. Thank you, Rachel. Any brief comments from TDC on this? Oh, I think Anna had already answered it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yep, and I've emailed both um, Nate and Mila already. Oh, super. Okay, excellent. Lindsay. Thanks, Joanna. Kia ora, and thank you, panel, for your excellent considered responses and the good questions, Joe. My question is a strategic one, and, and I'm in a way meeting our emissions targets. I feel a bit like landing a big plane. It's a fail-safe operation. We can't say, "Oh, we're going to get it right." three times out of four, we've got to get it right every time and have a buffer in there to make sure we land safely. 
Now, I know we can't predict every quirk of circumstance, but I also think that any council, not just these two, but everywhere, need to have a strategy or a rationale for how they're approaching this fail-safe question. For example, Tim, I don't want to single you out, but you referred to relying on the engineer's data, and hopefully that's okay. Um, we, we have the example of the recent adjustment to relative sea level rise all around the country. That suddenly shifted the goalposts. And there are lots of other examples. So I'd like to know how philosophically or rationale-wise the two councils are factoring in the need for a fail-safe landing of this big plane we're trying to get down on net zero. Thank you. Kate, you want to go first? <laughs> um, crikey, fail safe. Lindsay, I'm, I'm not sure that in this space there's, you could ever put your hand on your heart and say, we've got a fail safe um, process to get to where we need to be. There are so many moving parts. You're relying on so many people playing their part. Um, as nice as it would be able to say that, yes, we've got a plan, it's fail safe. We've built in such a, a margin that we know that we're going to get there with what we're intending to do. Um, I just don't think I, I'm in a position to be able to say say that we could. Uh, and, and the information that you said, like the example that you used is quite a good one because I, I think there seems to be an assumption that no one had thought about that until that information came out the other day. But we commissioned a report, I think in 2019, Diana, um, to look at precisely that issue it came out with slightly different um, findings from the recently released national one. It, it uh, agreed in relation to the, I guess, the Waimea area, Nelson, Richmond, and out around to Mapur near Motueka. Slightly different statistics around the balance of the district. But we had anticipated that at a reason. That has already been built into our planning. So I think sometimes there's a belief nationally that actually locally we're not taking these things into account. Whereas in this case, we'd actually already anticipated that as an issue and commissioned our own advice. Yeah, can I just chip in there? I think it's really important just to recognise that there is so much uncertainty around climate change. And so councils make decisions with the best available information that we have at that time. Um, and, you know, the NZC rise data was an example where, you know, new information has come through. And that's great because it adds to our understanding around climate change. And now as a council, you know, we can take that on board and we can respond accordingly. Thank you, does NZC can, want to make any may I just, oh. I'm sorry, carry on. Uh, I can comment briefly. Um, I think there's a lot of things people could have been doing 20 or 30 years ago, Lindsay. I think that um, we've known about climate change for many decades and, and if we'd responded to climate change like we responded to COVID, then the world would be a very different place right now. But um, that is not the nature of humanness or politics. And so people generally respond when they have to and when there's no other choice but to respond. So that's what you're seeing happening now is that you're seeing um, the world on fire, you're seeing floods and storms, and you're seeing people finally get that at a local personal level, climate change is going to affect them. So what are they gonna do about it at a local level? Because it's not just the people on the other side of the world who are going to be affected. Um, and st in terms of a strategic response, There's a lot, uh, Tim is absolutely right, that we have had 50 years of planning, like our Nelson plan covered flood modeling uh, in a lot of detail. We've known about erosion and sea level rise. So, so there has been um, predictions and analysis, but each year, I guess the, the predictions and the, the analysis gets a little bit better because more unknowns happen. So you have lots of, positive feedback loops, you have a very chaotic weather system, you have a very chaotic um, sea system. And so you start to get a better picture of how it's going to play out globally um, each year. That doesn't mean that you can't be adapting for a future of uncertainty and that you can't build resiliency into your thinking. So, so one of the things we know is that there's going to be uncertainty, therefore we have to 
think about how we build resilient communities. Now, resilient communities, to me, mean something quite different to perhaps what some people, uh, it means to me, it means that you can get on your bike and you can go and get some food locally, that you are able to get around and out and about when there's a extreme weather event. It doesn't necessarily mean moving our entire cities. That might be what it means to other people. And I think that's the conversation which is taking place now. Um, Joanna, may I just... I, I'm sorry, yeah. Kate, I thought you finished. And did you want to know about the did you want to know about whether we could be fail safe in our mitigation attempts as well? Was it purely around adaptation or mitigation? No, no, it was across the board because I think it's uh, we've got to land all of us plane, not just part of it. But my yeah. my comment in a way, what you've just said, Kate, and partly what Tim said, I was hoping somebody would use a word like safety factor. You know, there is a lot of uncertainty, there's no question. But the more uncertainty there is, the more safety factors we need. If we're going to land it, engineering design, they build in safety factors above the load they think they're going to have to take or to cope with weaker ground. And so I won't labor the point, but I think the point is that I haven't heard that it's more a matter of saying, well, we're doing our best, but there's no philosophy about building buffers in that really future proof us. And we've got failed aspirational policies for Africa at the moment. I won't go on, thanks, Joe, but I think yeah. I've made my point. Thank you both yeah. for your answers. Okay. I think Thank there's you. a lot of, sorry, I think there's a lot of buffers, but there's, I, I think that if you think about the COVID pandemic, you've seen that play out very rapidly in terms of policy change of uh, elimination and then learning to live with, with COVID. So if you think about that as a fast, compacted response to a crisis, this we have years to figure out and it will be uh, when, we, when it comes to the Mai Tai River, we can build um, small retention dams further up the river. We can bring in gates further down, which stop the high tides coming up. There's all sorts of ways we can buffer to learn to live with water um, more comfortably and more easily, especially when the water becomes more. But we can't ever be fail safe for those extreme, extreme weather events. It's a bit like expecting Australia to be fail safe for forest fires, which they've had to learn to live with for, for um, decades. Okay, thank you. Winston Churchill, who's not someone I usually enjoy quoting, said something like, it, it's not enough to say that you'll do your best, you have to do what's necessary to accomplish the end, end that we're aiming for. Now, yeah. Jan, Jan has his hand up again and I uh, would like to ask another question. Right, well, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, so do Nelson and Desmond councils have procurement policies in place that include low common requirements of tests or tests for its own activities, outsourced activities such as professional services and physical works, other services, and if not, why not? Okay, who wants to uh, start with that one? I can go first, Rachel, unless you want to go. No, you go for it, Kate. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think I think we're trying to. I think again, um, the council's uh, slightly slower to pick up pick up on. Um, at a, so at a governance level, we might set a strategic thinking that this is what we want to be doing, but it might not be picked up on through all strands. And I can give you a good example, we're having to replace our Harbour Master boat. Um, and d what do we replace that with? So, you know, that's that takes a conversation. What is our 10 year plan in terms of electrifying um, vessels on the water? So we've started to think about electrifying our buses and our cars. But, but that hasn't necessarily moved into, into boats on the water. And I think that it, um, those conversations are being had, uh, but it does take some time. Things like backup generators for civil defence. Can we um, have battery and electric generators rather than um, fossil fuel generators for those emergencies as well? In theory, that's that's doable, but it just requires more staff time to figure out the options. And I'm hoping we're getting there. I hope that's kind of what you're alluding to. 
Thank you, Kate. That's obviously, um, the only, only part I'm thinking about, for instance, I, I see public works that are using huge amounts of concrete. I, I really doubt whether that's what we want to do. So in your procurement, if you do a physical work, you can ask or require to use low carbon products, but I don't think councils think like that at all. So, so I think, right, just to touch on Kate's answer, it is a work in progress. So for example, in our procurement or our new contract for public transport, reflecting the government's approach to reducing emissions. So we'll be looking to embed things like decarbonisation, electric buses, in the future, our recent um, Waterwaker Library project. So we shifted away from a concrete uh, to a wooden wooden um, floor construction. So I think we are moving in this space. And as future projects come up, particularly building construction, it is likely to be a key part of those contracts. Is looking to utilise obviously both local products in terms of timber. Um, and uh, Kate mentioned the airport as an example. Uh, and, but the Mortowaker Library, again, there's always limits and challenges around budgets, et cetera, but this is a, a work in progress, but it is something I think both councils are uh, working to achieve. Thank you, Tim. Uh, on to Aaron Stallard. Kia ora um, Thanks for your time, everyone on the panel and everyone on the call. Um, we talk a lot about emissions reductions and not so much about the implications of that, because as we move away from fossil fuels, there are good reasons why we won't be able to replace that energy with renewables. So we will enter a period of um, energy scarcity or decline, expensive energy, and there will also be a need to ring fence our remaining budget to some degree so we can build the infrastructure we need for the next 100 years for a low carbon future. Um, and that will probably, because the growth of the past 70 years has been supercharged by fossil fuels, we may well enter an era of degrowth are these kind of issues discussed around um, the council table at all? Well, certainly growth or, or degrowth or the relative discussion um, is a pretty massive focus for council. I think growth underpins a huge amount or, or the lack of it, a huge amount. We didn't get to the energy question uh, and perhaps there'll be another forum like this where we can finish off the last four questions. But um, energy is a massive issue. Well, again, it depends on whether I guess you're a, a practic an optimist or, uh, or not. Well, I'm pretty optimistic. There is so much going on in terms of research and development, particularly around energy. Um, there's a saying that we didn't move on from the Stone Age because we ran out of rocks. And I don't think we're going to move on from the fossil fuel age because we run out. But over history, we have found ways. And I, I think that, you know, locally, we have opportunities around solar particularly. Uh, we hit, certainly have opportunities around future um, smaller hydro. Uh, so I guess I'm an optimist in terms of the energy debate. Um, and it, it, can, it can be both provided, but also be lower emissions. I, I, I think that uh, where, where Aaron is, is mentioning degrowth, he's referring to a, a planned uh, downshift in the in the the whole human enterprise of material and energy throughput so there'd be less material throughput less energy input i think i think that's am i right aaron that that's what you're referring to yeah it's a broader concept and certainly um you, you know i mean studies are quite clear that you know with the energy density of fossil fuels we just we just cannot replace them like for like with renewables and think we will continue as we are in terms of transport and where we live and how we get around and so on. Uh, and that's a reality that um, is not being addressed by decision makers, but it's gonna come to a crunch before long. Um, and it will just mean that when we talk about, for example, building some kind of um, energy intensive infrastructure in 20 years, we've extremely expensive and perhaps very difficult to build that infrastructure, whether it's, um, to um, address um, inundation, for example, or something to do with an airport, you know, using concrete, a lot of emissions embedded in that. Um, I, I just think our, that's a reality of our future and it won't be um, addressed by small hydro or solar powers because even solar panels, we're just exporting the emissions to China, claiming it's you know, emission free when it's not. So I, I think um, these concepts need to be at least in the back of the mind of decision makers because Within 20 years, we'll really see the crunch with energy and even the pricing of energy. Uh, we're seeing it now, but in 20 years' time, it'll, the world will be a different place because of it, I think. 
that's that's really helpful, Aaron. I think that this is sort of around reducing our consumption and reducing our waste. So how you create the circular economies as well. And whilst I agree with you, I think that um, I also agree with Tim that we have. So NRDA is looking at this very closely in terms of how we create regenerative economies. So Project Cookery has been tasked with really thinking about what our economy will look like into the future when we have less energy as well as um, sustainable energy. So I don't think there's been an assumption made that we will be able to access the same amount of energy. I think that's happening within housing as well, that we have to build smaller homes um, and that our homes have to be far more energy efficient so that they can be positive, um, positive, uh, climate positive and carbon negative. And, and that's, that's achievable. And the airport is a good example where it's shown that that is achievable. And the two councils collectively task the airport with trying to achieve that goal. So um, you're right, things will become far more expensive. And so we're going to have to become, we're gonna to have to, streamline our choices of where we want to spend our money on high infrastructure projects. Um, and in many ways, you're seeing that playing out right now with uh, Russia and COVID. So, so it's incredibly expensive to build at the moment. And so people will probably begin to build smaller and drive less as a result of a whole lot of other reasons, be they Thank good or bad. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. I want to give the last question to Nate and then we'll close. Uh, and uh, brief brief question, brief answer. Um, okay, I'll try. I've actually got two questions. They are quite short. Um, I don't know if anybody here has kind of touched on it. Um, so how is the council, well, how is NCC and TDC um, promoting climate education? mostly through schools, I think. And um, how are they focusing on sectors that are already sustainable or partially sustainable? Good question. Uh, brief answers, please. Starting with uh, TDC. Uh, kia ora, Nate. Um, so as well as in virus schools, we do um, on our website and through Newsline, which is the um, lot of fortnightly newspaper, mini newspaper thing that goes out to all Tasman residents. Um, and we often have articles about climate change related things in there. Um, and things get reported through the Nelson Mail as well when the reporters pick up on those related stories. Um, sorry, what was the second question again? About the, oh, oh do, you, do you wanna? Yeah. Oh yeah, um, about how the council is already focusing on sectors that are sustainable or partially sustainable already. You mean instead of the other sectors? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we do. Obviously, it's easier to um, talk to people who are already interested in the subject. But as a council, we do have to um, speak to our entire community. And so it is something that we're always working on. I don't know if Tim or Diana want to make any further comment about that part, but yeah, uh, we don't we don't discriminate. We just <laughs> it's just yeah, it's, it, like with busy people with busy lives, you know, it's hard to engage people if they're already doing other things and they're just not interested. I guess. Yeah. I'll I'll skip straight to NCC as uh, for the last word on education. Uh, Rachel, do you want me to answer? Ah, uh, yeah, sure, go for it. Yep. Um. So NCC has a really strong link to Enviro schools, but we've also been working quite closely um, with Waka 2 in developing a collaboration with Denmark, Lemberg in Denmark around a climatorium, um, which has a strong, so that model is based on a quadruple helix, whereby you have community education, um, businesses and government all working together in, in developing responses to climate change. So education is a really big theme in terms of that quadruple helix. Um, I touched on our, our link into Youth Council and someone commented that as Youth Council um, representative of the youth in our community, 
I think it's as representative as it can be and I think the Youth Council is very aware that they need to reach out to more of their community. We also have had, um, uh, so the design of the youth park came from uh, Stoke, Stoke community, youth community. So we, we do reach out to other aspects of our youth in terms of uh, seeking their input and how they want to shape our communities of the future. In terms of your second question was a little, your second part of your question was a little confusing for me. You're wanting to know how, whether we support businesses which are perhaps taking a climate change response. So Nelson uh, supports businesses for climate change. And we've also given a very clear direction to NRDA to seek to support that transition. So there is a lot of work being done by NCC and um, funding uh, going towards businesses which are trying to support climate change uh, initiative. That's happening in our waste stream as well and in our environment stream. So, so we do uh, have a tendency to partner with what you might call social enterprises, more people who are committed to creating a business which is uh, responsive to climate change plus taking good care of the environment. And um, we do tend to work more closely with, with them and, and, and likewise with events. So that's the only other thing I can think of as events. Uh, we have really worked hard to make sure our events are zero waste and increasingly more sustainable too. Okay. Um, now, um, I, I just noticed that Marie Lindaya said she had raised her hand and yeah, uh, her hand was up for quite a while. Oh, I'm so, so I'm so sorry, um, Marie. I let me. The, the, um, that's okay. It's rather you. late now because uh, I did put my question up. They keep then Kotokato. I know it's rather late, and I wasn't sure how I could lighten the tone of my uh, so skin, skin, my skin there, or <laughs> rather literally or figuratively. So on the on the thing, because I've had it brown. Yeah, so my question is there anyway. So it's just about the the um, input, uh, the Mataranga Maori, uh, the Ao Maori into the whole, um, the territory in, embedded into the whole climate action plan. Um, and also how you can engage more of the um, migrants and resettled communities because to us, resili community resiliency is simplicity. So to, for us to buy in into this, the whole climate action plan. What programs have you got in place? So you can rep just reply on the uh, on the chat or on an email from the council because I know everyone's really tired and wants to go to sleep and have a big day tomorrow. So tena koto kato akiora. That's all right, <laughs> kiora Thank, everyone. Thanks for your and, understanding. And I will. That's okay. That's okay, Joanna. I'm, I'm sorry I can't lighten that skin tone on the on my hand race. <laughs> no, I. It's really <laughs> funny. Really fun. I'll, I'll be more attentive yes. in future. Thank yes. you, Marie. No, it's okay. Okay. Well, I I do want to thank very sincerely uh, the the panelists, who, all of whom who have done a day's work and spent their evening talking to us. Um, Mayor Tim, Councillor Kate, Anna, Diana, and Rachel. Thank you all very much for. Um, helping us understand what councils are doing and what you hope to do in the future. And thanks to participants uh, for, for thoughtful questions uh, uh, as we all go forward together in this huge and sort of life and death endeavor. I want to close with a quiet reflection that we who are gathered here together in dialogue about this crisis, we'll do our very best to be good ancestors. Thank you and good night to all. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, everyone.